The Lord be with you there. And what do you say? The Lord be with you here. All Amen. Right. Okay. We'll dismiss them now. Is that is that good? Okay. I wish I could go, but I gotta be up here. That's right. I get the privilege of uh, reading some scripture, praying for my wife, and then setting down. Amen. She's gonna speak tonight and in the morning, and then I'll be the next time. I've always amazed at this word in Psalms 107:20, where he says. He sent forth his word and healed them. His word was sent forth and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. And we could say, of what destructions? It could be a multitude of anything. We're going to be using a little phrase this week. Whatever he wants to reveal is probably what he wants to heal. When he reveals it, We'll deal, and he'll heal. But we will boldly and gladly come to the throne of grace to receive whatever he has for us this week. And I pray that by our being here in some way, as servants, fellow campers, that he will be able to speak through us to you that will benefit you and your walk with Christ. If that mission is accomplished, it was worth the trip. Hallelujah. His spirit is contagious. We give it away. Here and there with a smile or a hug or whatever. Your CFOers know most of you. You know what I mean. It's like a movement when we get together that just can't stop. <coughs> Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm really looking forward to this week. Sounds like good preaching to me. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Father, again, we are so grateful to you that you call all of us to be here this week. We're not here by chance or accident. We look at it on you, God, as being the superstar of the advanced organizers. And you knew a long time ago that we were to be here this week. You have something to say to us. I pray, Father, that the ear of our heart will be open, the eyes of our heart will be open, and our spirit will be open to receive you, Lord. Anoint each one of us this week, those that are in travel and coming. Anoint us, God, with the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may know even more so who we are in you. Tell us, Lord. Father, I pray now in Jesus' name that you break all the ties that bind, except that tie that binds us to you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. May your joy, God, and during this week overwhelm us for what you did for us and for who we are in you. We say that in the name of Christ, our Lord and our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As Tommy amen. Tyson used to say, got you covered. Got you covered. <laughs> Good to be back to Iowa. Always good to be in the Midwest. We're from the Midwest. Somebody said, well, how long have you been in Parsons, Kansas? I said, we were born and raised there. <laughs> Both of us. I, I'm the only one of nine children that's still home. <laughs> and, um, but that's the power of prayer, isn't it? My daddy was a prayer warrior, and he prayed all nine of us into the kingdom. Six ministers out of nine is not bad numbers, is it? And so, indeed, God is faithful. That's what we want to say to you today. And Sarah, was it Sarah? But I was thinking about that last song you sang, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. There's a scripture in Revelations, and I couldn't look it up quickly. But do you remember that they say 24 hours around the throne without ceasing? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is yet to come. And I like to refer to that like this. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was in my life and your life, he is in my life, and he's yet to come in my life. Don't you feel that way about it too? So it's exciting to be here and to share the Lord with you. 
Uh, we have three sons. We now possess 16 grandchildren and 10 great-grandchildren. So we've been a busy family since we saw you last. And many of you who watched our kids go through their teens and individuate and build the word of their testimonies and the many things that in one of your songs is through trials and Jesus said in this world you'll have trials and tribulations, but be of deep sadness. Uh, I don't think so. What do you say? Be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. There's nothing our Lord Jesus has gone through that we won't experience that we cannot have. We don't need to be victims. We have victory. We are overcomers. We are not overcome. And I pray that this, these are times of refreshing as you come here. I pray that, that we will have the rivers of living water flowing beautifully in and through and out of us. I remember taking, you know, I'm grateful to CFO. Are there any first-timers here I want to ask tonight? Any brand new? Praise the Lord, my brother. You're going to experience Jesus at, at every level that you can experience him. But do take part in the whole program. There isn't a bit of the program that won't minister to you as you attend to it. And you never know, the word serendipity is to discover something I wasn't looking for and I didn't even know was there. That's my Jesus. He's a serendipity God. He loves to uh, recreate and create and change and meet you at all the unexpected places. Dick and I did uh, last September. My mother, I kept her the last three years and was able to help her uh, go home to be with the Lord in her home. And it was a wonderful and different experience that God enabled the strengthening to do that. And she loved Jesus, and she was anxious to be with him. And it was a, a great privilege to be able to see her home. Uh, in, in that experience, you tap into the depths of things you're not able to do. So Dick and I attended the Arkansas retreat last fall as the speakers of the retreat. And, you know, you go and you think, God, where are you going to touch me? Am I going to be touched in the singing time as Dick was at a camp? The first time he went to Ardmore CFO in 1970, he went forward and Marge Lawrence was leading the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, and he did. And all of a sudden, this Baptist guy raises his hands and says, Oh, Jesus! And the tears began to flow down his cheeks to my joy. How many of you wives know you pray about... I prayed about 13 years. Oh, Lord, I won't take any credit for that. Wonderful man of God. But, you know, like he says himself, if I can quote him, I was a Baptist and I was a good old boy. But as far as Jesus, I was good for nothing until he joined and this family of God where you can discover who you are, what he wants you to do, and he can surprise you. And so that was our experience. But you know what, guys? I want to tell you something. Those tears didn't stop for three days. We left for an eight-hour drive back to Parsons. He'd go into the shower and come out wetter from the tears, and he did the water. And he said, what is this? Well, they were the sovereign outpouring of God's love. And God said that was the evidence of his healing flow. I hadn't heard of a baptism of tears, but my husband experienced it. And the more that that healing came through, the more freedom and cleansing, very much like the prayer language some of us are, have experienced in Jesus. And that's perfect prayer without the interference of my private opinion. <laughs> I can pray God's prayers without knowing or being embarrassed or whatever, you know, because Corinthians says he that prays in this special way, if they're warriors of the Spirit, can do this and they pray expressly to God. Working with teenagers, we needed to know how to pray in a very spiritual manner so that God could reach them in special ways. Uh, we also, so anyway, while I was in Arkansas, I thought, well, Lord, when are you going to touch me? And so it was the very last morning. It was Sunday morning, and Dick had the morning meditation. And he was uh, sharing it with us. There were about 10 of us in there, Judy Bass, Bill Godfrey, and some of the precious brothers and sisters there. And he was reading, the, you know, morning meditations. If we're here in the morning and you listen to the word, it'll minister to you. So Dick was reading this, Psalms 30, 
oh no, it's 29, 10. Hear, O Lord, and have mercy. Be gracious to me, O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing for me. You have put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness to the end that my tongue and my heart and everything glorious within me may sing praise to you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. But now here's the interesting thing about the Holy Spirit. He was reading it very slowly. You've turned my morning into dancing. I've been through a time of mourning. And I heard this little thought within me say, Today, Judy, I have removed your sackcloth of responsibility and girded you with gladness. And I went, whoa, I've had this responsibility for years, and it's suddenly gone. And with it came a healing from his word that went clear through my inner core of my being. Have you ever experienced that from the word of God? I thought, Father... How wonderful. I said, uh, Dick, would you read that again? I don't mean to interrupt you. What did you say? <laughs> I've turned, I've removed your sackcloth of responsibility. And when a flash, this big old room where we were in and just sitting in the corner, the eight of us in a little dorm room, suddenly in my heart, I saw the Lord pick me up and spin me around that room like you would dance with a little child just laughing, ring around the rosy type and experience. I want to tell you what a healing that was for this woman. It was wonderful. Meditations, don't miss it. God may have exactly what you need there. How do I know I had that healing touch? Well, when I went into the song service following, I could sing in that high octave of the spirit in a way I had not done in six years. I don't know where it got shut down, but suddenly out of my spirit came beautiful praise and worship. And I became, in the Lord, a pillar in his tabernacle. Let me share that word with you. We were at CFO in California, and uh, I had a teenager, big old Baptist kid. I we're picking on Baptists tonight anyway. He had come in, and he was just trembling all over. And he said, Judy, I, I don't know what's going on with me, but God told me to come here and talk to you about it. And it was pretty obvious that the anointing of the Lord was just flooding all over this brother. And his name was John. So we prayed for him. The Lord met him in that personal, intimate way, filled his heart with that overflow of his precious spirit and presence. How, I tell you, I'll never forget it because John took off with a high five and hit the ceiling. <laughs> he went, hurrah, man, and he hits the ceiling. And I thought, wow, boy, that's something. Well, when he went into the tabernacle, he was sitting in the back of the tabernacle. Now, the Bible says in the last days, and, and we're in his days, that your young men shall see visions and your old men will dream dreams. As Dick's had three visions, so I tease him and I say, well, when you start having dreams, you're going to change categories. <laughs> but John was sitting in the back of the sanctuary when in the worship. And now we're talking a big camp back then, 400, 500 people. And in the worship, he saw the Shekinah glory of God fill that tabernacle. He saw this silvery, shimmering, gold, silver presence as we worship the Lord, and he went, whoa. But then he saw something deeper. He saw over every individual in there a pillar in the presence of the Lord. Are you following me? And he said the people that were tuned into God and praying, as, as they were praying, praising God and focusing on God, his presence began to fill their pillar. Okay. But the people that were busy with their friends writing notes or the mothers that were distracted with children or something else going on, he looked into his sorrow, their pillar was empty. And I said, you know, John, if that's of God, it'll be in the word because God confirms his word. And then we looked in Revelations 3.12. He said, I would that you would become a pillar in my sanctuary. Amen. Isn't that fun? You never know where God is going to touch you. 
or how he's going to meet you. But we want him to meet us. Lord Jesus, come. Come quickly this week. Any way we need you. Every way we need you. What about rhythms? I've known lots of people been touched in devotion and motion. We had a lady in South Dakota that came with a broken foot. And it wouldn't heal. And when we were in our rhythms class, just praising God and worshiping together, suddenly she said she felt a prick on her foot like a lightning strike, like it was burning, and she went, what's going on? And the Lord said, I just healed your foot. Now, that was fun. That was a real celebration. I had a healing take place in a relationship between a husband and wife in a devotion and motion operation one time, and we were moving in our midst and, and doing celebration time, becoming children before the Lord again, and this very intellectual husband that just couldn't quite get it down here, suddenly God struck him in the heart, opened up vistas for him, and when that class was finished, they never made it to creatives because she was laying in his lap sobbing with him. And God touched and healed them right there in, crea- in the rhythms. Creatives, oh my, don't miss those. Choose where Jesus wants you to go. Writing, art, drama. We had an interest. And listen, you see, we are campers that speak. We are campers that are just gently leading with you to discover what God wants to do with all of us while we're together. Right. Isn't that fun? And so at Kansas last week, our drama brother... First time he's ever gone into drama that he didn't take some sort of suggested thing with him, but he had gotten diverted, and he thought, well, it's sort of the last day, so I'll just go in there and see what they want to do. (laughs) How many of you know God loved to meet him there? Because when they got in there, this little uh, Timothy, he's about, he's preschool, I think he just starts kindergarten or first grade this year. He said, well, what do we want to do today? He said, I want to do revelations. Yeah, Armin went, whoops, revelations, Uh uh-huh. And the other one spoke up and said, yeah, let's do the dragon. (laughs) So he, he opens his Bible to Revelations 11, and there it was, the story of the dragon. And how, and you know, and they acted that out, and one of my friends got to be the pregnant woman <laughs> and they had angels and they had uh you know good angels and they had bad and I it was quite an experience now those children will ne- big children and little children will never forget that creative drama and I remember what have you ever met somebody that is just just super loud and raucous and they kind of you know it takes a lot of effort to love them and I knew, <laughs> I knew this lady that God's effort. Well, my effort, but God's grace. Yeah, God, you love through through me, right? And so she she, uh, but she you know she said she went into drama, and they were doing a, a parable with Jesus, and this little boy was Jesus, and she was so blessed. She said that little boy just captured her heart, and before they were through, they did a second drama where the little boy opted to be Judas. And suddenly her feelings for that little boy were switching. And she said, God, what's going on in me? He said, I've been trying to show you, Sue, for a long time how judgmental you are and how quickly you judge people. Hello? She came out of that one a changed person. Creative art, where we can go and and throw some things of praise. See, you're taking it in, in the, in the speaking and in our sharing times. And then when you go, it's an expression out to him. We want to create a gift for God that will be not only a blessing and insight to us, or a blessing to others. And writing, and I will be writing letters to God. I want to tell you, when I wrote my letter to God before taking on the real commitment to let Mother finish her course and run her course, I got it back. And in it, the Lord said, you take her home. She just had a, about two weeks in a hospital with a septic blood infection. We thought we would, you know, they didn't think she'd pull out of it, but she did. And I had the most beautiful time and a gift of four days with my mother as mom. <laughs> the mom that raised me, the one that knew what was going on. She's a nurse anyway. And, and the one that, it was a wonderful gift of the Lord Jesus to me. 
But in my letter to God, I had said, Mother, what about Mother God? You write your thoughts and your concerns to him. You turn it over and in faith let him write you back. And this is what arrived at my house. I could have brought your precious mother home to be with me long ago because she'd been wanting to go for five years. But my timing in this delicate matter is very important. I thought, Lord, I never thought about someone dying and graduating being a delicate matter. But it was so. It was a blessing to begin to catch these little insights that he has these little gifts, these little revelation moments when he wants to meet you specifically in a way that will bless you and the body of Christ. Amen? And all of you, I know, have your special moments with CFO. We have many. We've seen the Lord visit us in the teenage groups and, and saw him set young people in their gifts and callings and pastors and evangelists and, and teachers. And uh, in all these wonderful ways, God wants to meet us this week. Lord, we're open. Are we not open? Can we say, come, Lord Jesus, come and give us all that you have for us? Lord, you're so good. We have a good God. And when I, in our church, if somebody says, God is good, they respond and say, all the time. Amen? So God is good. All the time. Good. <laughs> all the time. Thank you, Lord. All the time. And, I, and he's faithful. Excuse me, that's a little moisturizer I'll be using as we go along. I want to, um, when we've come from the busyness, Lord, would you cleanse us of all the deposits of the world? You know, in the book of Acts, it says, come out from among the crooked generation. You remember that passage in the book of Acts? Come out from among the crooked generation and come in to me. And that's what we want this week for you. We want God to bring us into himself. I remember taking a friend to hear that beloved, beloved uh, patriarch of CFO, Tommy Tyson. He's touched all of us, hasn't he? And we were sitting next to each other, and he said, Listen, body of Christ, Jesus wants to live his life through you. How many of you say amen? amen? He wants to live his life in you. Amen. And he wants to live his life as you. Amen. And she went, what did he say? Wait a minute. You mean God? You... Now, I'm not new aging you. Understand, you're not going to find a person more scriptural than this lady. But Colossians 1.27, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Lord Jesus, come and indwell me. Incarnate me, Lord Jesus. That's very scriptural. Here I am. You remember the story about the little girl walking down the street? She looks up and says, well, Daddy, she was walking with Daddy. How big is Jesus? Well, honey, I reckon he's about as tall as I am. Probably about, you know. Well, Daddy, if he comes and lives in me, won't he stick out? <laughs> we're talking about him sticking out of us this week. Whether we're having meals together, whether we're walking like an Emmaus walk with a friend, when we're fellowshipping. I remember my son when we were having pizza at Kansas CFO in an afterglow time, and he had been given uh, the Osgood Slater knee diagnosis and loved football. And we'd come to camp with that in our hearts. And when we got in there at the pizza time, he, you know, uh, Barbara Ann Chase went over to him. You remember Barbara Ann? Yeah. Sensitive to the Lord. Jay, is something on your heart? Yes, Barbara Ann. I just got an Osgood Slater diagnosis on my knee. Well, God can take care of that, honey. In the name of Jesus, knee be healed. And it was. We left that camp and went back home, and he played football, went to the doctor. It was, there was no trace of it there. Where does God want to meet us this week? I would say everywhere. Want to say that with me? Everywhere. everywhere. You are special. Now, here's what I want you to say by affirmation. Colossians 1.27. Here we go. Dear Jesus, here I am. Dear Jesus, here I am. Love through my heart. Think through, my mind. Think through my mind. 
hear through my ears, see through my eyes, speak through my lips, touch through my hands, walk through my feet. Stand tall in me, Jesus, and do those greater works than you did when you were here on the earth. Amen? You made a commitment. Now watch him fulfill it. We were at Kansas, and we had a little girl there that was brought by a neighbor lady and her brother. And she didn't have anyone to help her write the letter to God. And we were going to do it after creatives. And this friend says, Judy has something for you, Christina. And she came over to me and I thought, or she said, Judy, you have something for Christina. And I thought, oh, I do? (laughs) You know, she's 10 years old. And I went, oh, what is it? Help her write her letter to God. And we went over and sat down at the table because she was moving to New Mexico and she was very sad about that. I said, Jesus, what do you want to say to her? See, all of us can prophesy. Now, let me clarify that word prophesy. All of us can prophesy. You bring edification, comfort, and exhortation. That little girl needed comfort. She needed to be exhorted that it was okay to move because Jesus was there too. So I started out with Jeremiah 29, 11. God's got a plan for your life, honey, and it's good. And the Lord Jesus is going to be with you there, and we pray that he would send her special friends, you know, that he would make the way for her. It was a wonderful experience for me as well as her. And she said, oh, is this letter going to find me in New Mexico since I'm writing it in Kansas? <laughs> yes, it will, honey. It'll be there. Now, what's simpler than that? How, which child can we bless this week? By sharing their picture or their time with them? God wants us to think of all of it. Amen? Amen. I want to share with you tonight a little different track. Oh, by the way, um, I'll do this in the morning. We're all familiar with Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, are we not? Now, see, the whole thing of that is the B attitudes. With the emphasis on being in the right heavenly attitude. <laughs> now, I remember when the Lord told me as a new Christian long ago, Judy, I could reach more people with your state of being than your state of doing. I ask you to be my witness. I ask you to work with me, not for me. Apart from me, you do no thing. You do nothing anyway. (laughs) So why don't you find out what I'm doing and then enjoy the trip? (laughs) So I want to start it with a little thing called the lesson. And any teachers in the room, you'll appreciate this. Jesus took his disciple up the mountain. You get the stars of red badges of courage out there these days. Jesus took his disciples up the mountain and gathered them around him, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are they that thirst for justice. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. Blessed are you when you suffer. Be glad and rejoice, for your reward is great in heaven. And Simon Peter said, Are we supposed to know this? And Andrew said, Do we have to write this down? And James said, Will we get a test on this? Philip said, I don't have any paper. (laughs) Bartholomew said, Do we have to turn it in? And John said, The other disciples didn't have to learn this. And Matthew said, may I go to the bathroom? (laughs) Judah said, what does this have to do with real life? Then one of the Pharisees who was present asked to see Jesus' lesson plan and inquired of Jesus, where is your anticipatory set and your objectives in the cognitive domain? (laughs) 
Oh, we do it, don't we? We are ordinary people with an extraordinary God that wants to come and indwell us. You see, it wasn't until I, I could be very religious before CFO, and I'm very glad for my upbringing. But it was in the camps that I discovered the family anointing of God. To meet Sarah's like to meet a daughter in Jesus. To meet uh, Sean, California, like a brother's son to us in the Lord. And when you meet him again and you get to visit, so you've never been apart. So it's a reunion time, unlike anything I've ever known. Sisters that are closer to me than my very own, and I have very close sisters. But I do want to share with you the Beatitudes, uh, and I want to give thanks to my older brother. Do any of you have a Holy Spirit-filled Bible, the new one, the Holy Spirit-filled Bible that's out now? Um, my brother Donald Pickrell is one of the contributors to that. He is a seminary prof, Life Bible College, for over 50 years, and he's in Australia building a Bible school over there, putting together one for them. Uh, he's been there three years. Um, but I want to read these to you. It's called The Beatitudes, and the basic problem in the Beatitude, if we're not living the way Jesus wants, then he paraphrases them, and he has them backwards. All right? I think you'll enjoy these and be blessed with them as much as I am. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's the basic problem if we're not being poor in spirit? Pride and rebellion. If I'm not poor in spirit enough to say, God, I need you. I need you. There's no doubt about it, Jesus Left on my own, I'm self-destructive. But I need to be poor enough to know that I need him. So paraphrased, happy are the receptive in spirit who know they are absolutely dependent beings. For then reality will back them. Backwards, miserable are the rich in spirit who live in false self-sufficiency and rebellion, for theirs is the kingdom of hell. You know, even when we started Faith Ministry, I remember the hardest thing in the world for me was to write a newsletter. And if someone had said, do you have any pride, Judy? (laughs) I think God had pretty well squeezed most of that out of me. In fact, my sons helped him along. How many of you know there was one point in our life when I was, the only thing Dick and I could be really grateful for was that we only had three. <laughs> Excuse me, God. And, and they were individualized, I mean, unique kids. They didn't fit the school system. Why? Because they were individually, and we know now, too, they were in that thrust of ministry that now, thank you, Jesus, After 15 years of praying for their conversion, they were saved, baptized by the Holy Spirit, but they were not converted. Luke 22, 32. The Lord said, pray for their conversion. You'll know they're converted when they begin to turn and minister to others, and they're not doing this self thing. But they're, how are you? Do you know Jesus? What are you? One of them's uh, leading worship in the vineyard now. And, you know, it's beautiful to see the transformation in their lives now that God's Lord of their life. Amen? So, number two, are you ready for this one? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. What's the basic problem here? Insensitivity and self-righteousness. Happy are the tender-hearted who remain vulnerable and repentant, for they shall develop a great capacity for depth of life. Yes, I've lost my mother. Someone else loses a mother. I know how to comfort them. But let me take you back to when I was 14 years old. Just beginning this walk in faith, receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit in about 1954. And I I loved my stepfather. When my stepfather, my parents divorced when I was four, And how many of you know that as a stupid child, (laughs) not stupid child, but as a wounded child, we could say, well, we 
tend to project if God is going to abandon me like my father, then why do I want to deal with God? Or if my mother rejects and abandons me out of her own woundedness, will God be there for me? And so we make these little bitter root judgments. We'll be getting into some of these deeper healing messages as we go along this week on my part of this presentation. But we make these little bitter root judgments. And what I did was say, now, and I'll get into that in depth. But so my stepfather dies unexpectedly, and he's crushed through this machinery. I went to school. We will never go through anything that God doesn't prepare our hearts to face. Now, he's faithful. So I'm sitting in school, high school in Parsons, Kansas. We just toured it with my 45th class reunion last week. And I'm sitting there circling. February the 15th, 1955. Why, why am I doing this today? Well, this is going to be a day I'll never forget for the rest of my life. Huh. And so I ponder that, and I go home. And my neighbor says, where's your mother? And I said, what do you mean, where's my mother? Where's my dad? He was always home by the time I got home. Well, I just went over your mother. I said, where's my daddy? Well, he's been killed. He's been crushed through this Katy Railroad back... Um, machine, and I'm going, oh, no, oh, no, not, not my daddy, not my daddy, not my stepdaddy, not the one that was there for me for five years and loved me and nurtured me and had time for me, and he, he was everything to me, Jesus. Wait a minute. And I went into grief. And I remember going into that funeral home alone and sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and saying, Where's daddy? Wait, what does this mean in my life? Didn't he say, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And it isn't someone coming along and saying, well, buck up. Now, just pull yourself together. That's not the kind of comfort we're talking about. But I heard a gentle whisper when I got quiet enough, and perhaps this will bless you or someone else. I heard this thought, Judy. I went through the loss of Joseph before the resurrection of Lazarus. I said, Lord, you really knew what it was to lose a father. Years went pretty quick, didn't they, too, honey? I remember the year we were, right after we left Cedar Lake CFO, God called Sean's daddy home. But when Jesus said, I went through the loss of Joseph before the resurrection of Lazarus, I said, Jesus, you do know what it is to lose a father. You do know. And the same grace that comforted him comforts us. That same power. So, some people could get bitter and angry, blame God, and not be tender-hearted. Blessed are the tender-hearted. So, let's look at it backwards. Miserable are the unconvicted and emotionally indifferent. For they will become spiritually superficial and lose touch with true feelings. Do you know anybody like that? It's too easy, isn't it? Number three, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What's our problem there? Defensiveness and anger. Happy are the non-defensive who can yield their rights... For this guarantees close personal relationships with others. Do you have anybody that you feel like you have to defend yourself with them? The Lord wants to be your defense. See, when he died on the cross, love was the lowliness of our Lord, openness, vulnerability, and exchange. He left himself totally vulnerable. Let's look at it backwards. Miserable are the manipulators who insist on their own way, for nobody can stand to be around them. Hello? (laughs) Ever been manipulative? I'll tell you, funny. Dick and I are at uh, California again doing a camp. And the girls come into camp, these teachers come in, they say, Oh, they're having a sale at Gunny Sack Warehouse. 
Now, girls' gunny sack dresses are these real lacy, old-fashioned, wonderful dresses. Found this great warehouse in San Francisco. I mean, it's, it's an experience. I've had two experience. One of them, I was from Kansas, and I had limited time, and so I'm going with this friend, you know, that, like a teenage buddy, and we're hitting, the, we're hitting. I want to try all these on as fast as I can. And so I'm kind of slipping a little bit closer through the line so I can get in there quicker, and I get by with that once. So I kind of go the second time, and my friend says, Hey, Jude, yeah? Aren't you being kind of rude? <laughs> and what I did, I didn't decide, yes, I was being rude. But after all, I was from Kansas, and I only had limited time. The Lord spoke to me and said, Honey, I've been trying to show you had rudeness in your spirit for a long time. Oh, thank you. Because Dick said it earlier, that revealing, when I accept that from Jesus, and we'll be teaching you more about that, and I take that to the cross and say, forgive me, Jesus, for being rude. Put that to death and crucify it and exchange it for politeness. Then I celebrate the transformation of my heart. Because we need to have our hearts changed, and they will be changed this week. And then I was able to wait my turn. So Dick and I are on our way home. Well, anyway, we're there, and they said, um, oh, you want to see the bargains at Gunny Sacks? Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, there's a whole dress rack, $5 each. I'm like, oh, can't wait for this meeting to be over. I said, honey, are we going to go to San Francisco as soon as this meeting in the Redwoods is over? Jude, uh, we need to talk about that. Oops. Well, honey, actually, we need to do more and talk about it. We need to pray about it. Oops. We're going to pray about it. Yeah, because we've been out on an itinerary, honey, and we won't be getting any honorarium, and we're not going to use plastic, and I think you just ought to pass this year. Oh, dear. We prayed about it, and I knew he was right. How many of you women know sometimes your husband is right? (laughs) Hi, 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 hi. I knew he'd like that. So we're driving down the highway. Hello, we're driving down the highway. And, and we are only, we're right at the Golden Gate Bridge. Anybody ever been to We are only one little bridge away from Gutty Sack. That's a little bridge? And I said, uh, honey, um, couldn't we go into the city for just a little bit? I mean, we're already here. Why not, Sean? You don't want to miss an opportunity like that. Uh, besides, honey, there's more than gunny sack there. <laughs> there's, uh, you know, there's the Fisherman's Wharf and the, the Ghirardelli chocolates, which I got burned out with. So they're not uh, all these wonderful things to do in the city. And we're here. I mean, he's driving down the road. Well, I have to start my campaign again when we get to the Oakland Bay Bridge area. And I said, sweetheart. Now think with me, some people save their money all year just to come to San Francisco as a family. We're already here. Why can't we just take a couple of hours and and go there, you know? Jude, I am surprised at you. We prayed about this, remember? (laughs) I'm sitting in the front of our van and I'm getting so angry, man. I'm going to tell you girls, from my bottom of my feet is coming up this anger I had not been in touch with ever and I'm going oh my god where is this I am getting so angry and I said Dick really honey won't you reconsider he said Judy I am so surprised that you listen do you want me to put your suitcase on the side of the road and let you just thumb your way to Kansas because I'm heading for Kansas oh boy I had to get up from the the captain's seat in the van and go to the back of the van. And I said, Jesus, why am I reacting like this? And he's faithful. He spoke through his word. (laughs) And it's from the book of Psalms. How many of you know the book of Psalms is God's tool book? And it's his prayer book. And we'll be learning a little bit more about that this week, too. But he says... Fret not thyself. It tends only to evil doing. 
And he said, honey, I've been trying to show you the sin of fretting in your spirit, Judy, because you don't like to take no for an answer. And if I cannot tell you no about earthly things like dresses, what's going to be at stake if I can't tell you no about my heavenly matters? Ooh. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the sin of fretting being revealed within me. And I bring that to your cross. And thank you for a godly husband that refused to be deterred once he knew what God's will was so God could heal my heart. And I went up with the apology. Honey, thank you. This is what was going on with me. And it was once it was healed, it was revealed and healed. Anybody relating? <laughs> kind of blank out there. So that was... So, happy, miserable are manipulators who insist on their own way for nobody can stand to be around them. Well, let's go through the next one. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Are you hungry and thirsty this week? For you shall be filled with the glory of God, the goodness of God, the blessedness of God, the healing of God. Our basic problem, if we don't hunger and thirst after His righteousness, apathy, and false moral sophistication. Happy are they who know they are structured in their inner being for goodness, for this alone leads to personal fulfillment. Miserable are those who hunger and thirst after evil, for they will always be empty people wondering what life is all about. Right? God says, seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. Lord, we want to give you all of our heart tonight. Number five, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What's our problem if we're not being merciful? Ingratitude and a judgmental attitude. You know, <laughs> Romans 2, 1. Who art thou that judgest, O Judy, seeing you're guilty of the very thing you accuse another? And if we do a common exercise, you know, the Lord likes to trick us. He said, write down everything you see wrong in everybody else. Boy, is it easy to do or what? Then he said, sign your name at the bottom. That's what that passage means. If I'm seeing something wrong in you, it's most likely that I have that seed within myself and I need to get it to Jesus and get it healed and crucified. Amen? Paraphrased. Happy are they who give people the direct opposite of what they deserve. For by giving grace instead of law, they release others to love. How many of you know if you forgive someone, John 16, is it, 23, when Jesus appeared in the upper room, breathed on him and said, receive my Holy Spirit. It's a basic for all of our Elijah housework because we, as the representatives of Jesus, as his ministers and priests, whosoever sin you remit, it's remitted. Whosoever sin you retain, it's retained. And I finally began to learn that if I would forgive Dick and remit the sin in his life and quit judging him for it Amen. and get out of God's way, and this is how it goes. Judy, if you will forgive him and absolve him and bless him, then my Holy Spirit can convict and change because Holy Spirit's holy. When you try to convict him and judge him, then my Holy Spirit can't do its work because it would add insult to your injury. Are you following me? It works. I like what works, don't you? And so I began to forgive quickly. Lord, hold not that to his charge. I wasn't saying he wasn't sinning. I said, hold not that sin to his charge. <laughs> Does it sound like Stephen and Saul of Tarsus? When Stephen had the courage to forgive Saul of Tarsus, who thought he was very religious and doing God a favor, and Stephen said, in the book of Acts, forgive him, hold not that sin to his charge. What happened a few more verses down the chapter? Come on, somebody. 
<laughs> you got it, Sean. But he had, now he didn't walk with Jesus like Peter, James, John, Thomas, the 12. Just like you and me, he's after the fact. He's walking down the Damascus Road. What happens, church? The Holy Spirit got him. What if we forgave everyone in the sphere of our life, absolving them like the scriptures tell us to, like God's instructed us to, holding not any charge against them, and let Jesus touch him, wouldn't you? He changed his whole personality, blinded him three days. He was no longer Saul of Tarsus. He was Paul the Apostle. Now, I've got a personal little thing I'd like to add to that. That's just Judy. Don't quote this as scripture. No wonder Paul wrote so many letters and did such work because he had to do his work and Stephen's. That's just Judy. Gospel according to second Jude. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to ask him when I see him someday. Is that true? Anyway, the grace to release others to Jesus and bless them. Backwards, miserable are the judgmental who give others exactly what they've got coming, for they'll wind up getting the same treatment. Judge not, lest ye be. Now, how would you like the Lord to put a rein on you where he says to you, Judy, I'm going to hold your thought lives in rein. Did you know that as I've come to live in you, all right, are you with me? I come and bring my kingdom is within you and around you, that your thoughts shout in heaven like your words on earth. It was a rude awakening for me. Whew, Jesus. No wonder he says in 2 Corinthians 10, bring all your thoughts into my captivity. It'll keep you young looking. It's worth it, isn't it? Number six, blessed are the pure in heart. Don't you love this? For they shall see God. I want to see God in you this week. Jesus in you, the hope of glory. I hope you see God in me this week. That's why we've come apart, to see God. But more than that, we'll see God as he is, not how we thought he was. He was not the God who abandoned me as a child. I had healing for that. Basic problem, hypocrisy and impure motives. Paraphrased. Happy are they who know that character is the key to reality. For God created a moral universe that can only be understood by transparently real hearts. How many of you hate phonies? Not hate the phonies, but you hate phony behavior. And I tell you what took that out of me was getting in front of teenagers for 20 years. Hello? I'm going to walk in there. If Dick and I didn't have our act together when we got in there, forget the anointing. Don't think they won't know it. I remember one young, well, Bill Hamilton attended Hastings, Nebraska with us at his first CFO. And he wanted to tag along because he wanted to be a youth leader, and he is a magnificent youth leader and pastor now, right? But he's just a kid. And he came in, and he watched Dick and I night after night, and he came in, and he said, you know, French, is what amazes me about you guys is you are so organized. I thought, oh my gosh, God, do I look organized? We didn't know what we were going to do till we got in there because we gave Jesus the opportunity to do what he wanted to do. And it was fun that way. But it came off organized. All you have to do to something of the Spirit is organize it and you'll kill it, right? Jesus had a little lamb but it never became a sheep. It joined the average church and died for lack of sleep. (laughs) We don't want to organize God, but we want to be transparent. I can be transparent with you here. Now, I I tell on myself, we're at Hastings CFO, you have to be anointed if you're going to be dealing with 60 kids, right? And our children are working alongside. They're doing music and they're fishing the kids in and we're praying with them and ministering to them. And we get home. It's about three or four days later. And my middle son, I told you we're the product of our kids and you love them. 
And it's a joy to me to see our grandchildren now serving CFO, BJ and Chris Dan Hart from Atlantic, Iowa here doing youth now. They're wonderful. They're Kansas youth. So anyway, we get home and Terry says, Mother, I have a question for you. He's the little guy that gets you in the heart. What is it, Terry? Well, how come at camp you're Miss Goody Two-Shoes and when you get home you're just plain mom? I'm not, you know, and I said, Terry, son, it's God's anointing and it's his grace because those precious warriors that we're working with needed healing and anointing. But I tell you what, son, what I want you to pray for mama is that the day will come when you don't see such a difference between the anointing and the grace of God every day in my life. I want Jesus to become more and more real through me. I want his love to throw, flow through me. I want his words of wisdom, his words of knowledge, his encouragement, his discernment, his prophecy, his interpretations, his faith, gifts, and miracles, and healings. Why? Because we need it this week. And catch up on those and find out what it is he wants to move in our midst. Well, miserable are the phonies who live secret lives, for they'll feel like hell. (laughs) Amen? Seven, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Basic problem, resentment and unresolved inner conflict. Paraphrased. Happy are those who are in right relationship with God, their self, and others. For they, like God, will be agents of reconciliation. We've all been given the ministry of reconciliation, Corinthians says. Five, isn't it? Miserable are the troublemakers who never put things right for they will never be called by anybody to do anything. God, let us all be peacemakers this week. Amen? Number eight. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're getting a little more maturity here. We're getting a little tougher here, aren't we? I remember a young lady coming up to me and saying, Judy, high school is really hard. Because I don't date and mess around with guys. And I'm accused of being a lesbian and all I do is love Jesus. And I'm a virgin and I'm going to keep my virginity. And she was persecuted for it. It, There's all kinds of ways to go through that kind of persecution. And it's going to increase as the time gets harder, isn't it? I mean, you know the old saying, I know you've heard it. But if we were arrested for being Christians... Would they find enough evidence to convict us? Amen? Well, the problem there is fear and insecurity. If we have perfect love, perfect love casts out all fear. And if we have insecurity, then who's our security? The Lord Jesus. And the fear of man is a snare. Whenever the angels appear scripturally or all throughout the scriptures, they're always saying, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not, little flock, fear not. But we're so human, sometimes that persecution's coming at us and we don't quite see through it. Well, Jesus can handle that for us, can't he? And he'll help us with those matters. Happy are the spiritual mature who can live under pressure, for this shows they are in harmony with the principles that run the universe. This is my Father's universe. This is my Father's world. I think Job found that out too, didn't he? I said, when I get to heaven, I want to hug Job first. I have a request. Jesus, even let him meet me, if you will, because I could relate to that, brother. But in God wants to see what I heard someone say one time, you know, if you're having trouble in your life, it's probably because God is bragging on you. 
And I thought, w would you mind doing a little less bragging for just a little while? <laughs> Anybody ever feel like that besides me? Huh? Okay. Miserable are the compromisers who stand for nothing, for they will fall for anything. The last one here. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Anybody think that's easy? I remember going clear to California in 76. I went into creative writing, and I just discovered the fivefold office ministries. And I was saying, Jesus, what are Dick and I doing with all these kids all the time? The Lord said, Well, you're minister to the heart. You move in the prophetic area of ministering to people's hearts. You're evangelist to the heart, and a prophet in that sense of ministry and anointing. And I said, Oh, well, that's interesting. So I bring it home, this little telegram I wrote, a pre gram in creative writing, and I show it to my father. Now, my daddy's walked in Pentecost with the Holy Spirit since 1900. And he, he was a strong man of the Lord and of the Word. And all of a sudden, he looks at me and he says, Huh, blessed are you when men shall persecute you and say all men are against you. He's, you know, for my sake, so persecuted they the prophets before you. And he was going on and on. I was going, whoa, now, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you mind stopping just a little bit? But you know what? I want to tell you something. God is in control. We don't have to be in control. And if we have control issues, it's because we can't trust. People that cannot trust have to be in control. So the Lord gave me an acrostic for trust. T-R-U-S-T. Taking refuge under strong tribulation or kids' temptation. We know where our source of refuge is. The name of the Lord's a strong tower. The righteous run into him and are safe. The Lord is my hiding place. To touch me is to touch God's anointed. Well, what's the basic problem in this last one? Negativism, being negative and ignorant. Somebody says something negative to you? What do you do? Get in the molly grubs about it? Well, I walked over to my daddy's house one day, and the Lord gave me a Jeremiah at the potter's wheel lesson. You know? I think it's Jeremiah 17 in there. He goes to the potter's wheel room, and he watches the potter make this vessel. But the vessel was marred right in his hands, the Bible says. We don't know whether the clay had, uh, you know, the water supply to it was messed up or, or what was going on, but the vessel was marred in the potter's hand. And he didn't just throw it away, but he remade it into another vessel, as was seeming in his plan and purpose. And I want to tell you, not a thing can happen in our life, but what Father God doesn't have the delight and joy to recreate because he's creator. The blood of Jesus is the eraser on his pencil. And he wants to recreate that into a vessel of his liking. God, why did you close this work over here that we poured our life into this, this community work, Laity Lighthouse, that Dick and I had our training ground on? Oh, God, it lasted three years. So many lives were touched and changed. Some people are going to look at that like it was a failure. God says, you learned in my lesson of hard lessons here things that you could never have learned in seminary. But you learned them. This time is over. So he shut the door. Now, I have a saying for you. There's no such thing as success or failure in the kingdom of God. Just growth. Can you say it with me? 
No such thing as success or failure in the kingdom of God. Just growth. He said, they're both imposters. It's the world system. You're not of this world. You're in it, but you're not of it. And that set me so free, Priscilla. (laughs) Somebody say, well, how did the meetings in Iowa go? Well, ask somebody that's there. You'll tell them. But I won't be judging whether this is, quote, success or failure because we're going to be growing this week. And this is a place to test it out. This is a place to experience those things Jesus wants you to experience. It's the first time Dick ever played for rhythms, played in a camp. It was camp that developed his musical talent. Sarah, and you're beautiful. Jenny? Jenny. What a gift. And you've got a place here to do it. We don't care if you make a quote mistake who's judge we're just enjoying it right and that's what this is all about well no negativism and no ignorance happy are they who are so good that they can turn anything and everything into a positive testimony for this proves they live by the truth of god's word and not by their circumstances Paraphrase backwards, miserable are the negative who always see the worst in everything and are ignorant of hope, for they merely exist like the rest of the world. Has it been a blessing to you tonight? I want to give you an acrostic for hope in closing. And by the way, I brought some of these with me that you can take copies. Hope. Lord Jesus, here's our hearts. Your heart open for personal encouragement. Lord, will you open our hearts for hope this week, the substance of faith, and we will give you the praise and the glory. Amen.